Is your home or that of an older loved one filled with 50 plus years worth of stuff? This is Kinsley Turnipseed with My Other Mother. We specialize in senior move management, helping seniors transition into their next great adventure. We do this with compassion and dignity by encouraging them to keep the memories and lose the stuff. Right size, downsize, age in place, what will your legacy to your family really be? You can reach us at meetmyothermother.com. I once dropped an entire glass of peanut butter on my kitchen floor, shattering shards and splattering peanut butter in every direction. I spent hours cleaning glass-filled glop off the floor, cabinets, table legs, the dishwasher, the pantry door, and more. Then there was the time I was replacing my sliding glass door with French doors. Removal of the original door exposed a wet subfloor that needed to be replaced before we could finish installing the new door. You guessed it. Today, we're talking about huge messes. I'm Anna Gelbin Edmonds, the host of Navigating in Reverse. This podcast is for people caring for seniors, which are usually the adult children who often find themselves in an awkward role reversal of having to parent their parents. In all fairness, the intro to this episode doesn't do justice to what we'll be talking about today. My food spills and water damage pale in comparison to the types of messes we're going to be discussing today. My guest is the king of cleanup, the duke of dirty jobs, and an all-around fun guy. Mike Young is the owner of Palmetto Commercial Services, South Carolina's leading and award-winning commercial cleaning company. Welcome to Navigating in Reverse, Mike. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, we're super excited to have you. I have been waiting for, I can't, since since day one of the podcast to have you on here. But before we start, in full disclosure, I have to let the listening audience know that, that your company, Palmetto Commercial Services, does sponsor the podcast. So I don't even know where to begin. So I'm going to let you, in one or two sentences, tell us what you do. We do the cleaning stuff that most cleaning companies either don't want to do or don't know how to do. So it goes beyond basic house cleaning services and janitorial type services. And we got calls years ago from DSS about, can you do this type of job or can you do this in 30 days or 45 days because somebody's facing potential backlash or eviction? And we had to figure out, number one, how to do it. Number two, how to do it quickly and then number three, if we could do it affordably. So we we had to figure out all these things throughout our career to figure out what made the most sense and what would help people the most. So you did start out with a general cleaning company. Right. And it's built up to, I'm going to go ahead and say it, your big thing is hoarding and, issue, and infestations, sure. correct? Right. So – I have in front of me a list of like 11 areas that you – general areas that you work in. And, of course, we can't – don't have time for a deep dive into all of them. As a matter of fact, I've already promised Mike so everybody knows every quarter we're going to have him back because he's got so many stories to tell and so many interesting things to say. So we want to gear this conversation to the caregiving community, the senior community specifically – so I think that you're going to drive more of the conversation than my questions do because I have so many questions. Sure. So I see you at every networking event that I go to that has to do with seniors. So talk to us a little bit about your connection to the senior industry, the senior care industry. Because we get so many calls involving either seniors or people with mental disorders, the senior community was just a community that we were part of and didn't realize that we were part of it. Okay. We were, we just thought we were a cleaning company. And then we realized that the specialized work that we do is geared more towards seniors, but can be open to other people as well. So why is that? Why is it geared more towards seniors? A lot of times if we're working with seniors that have mobility issues or, other type of issues and they can't physically do the job, they need to be able to hire people that they can trust to come in and actually get the work done and make sure that it's done completely. Okay. It's different if you're dealing with a salesperson that says, you need to do this and this and this. We try to take a step back and figure out what the total need is and then figure out what they need and then what they don't or what's the most urgent and get that taken care of. And then 
at least provide them with options to be able to get what they need taken care of, taken care of completely. Okay. So we don't have to be the full service provider for all of it. Okay. So what's a typical, um, if I'm caring for my senior mom, what's a typical phone call someone like me would make to you? What's a typical phone call that you would get? So typically we'll get the phone calls from either home health care that say, you know, the house is in too bad of disrepair. There's there's too much stuff in here. It needs a good deep cleaning before caregivers can come in and, and put any amount of time to be able to maintain it. Would you guys be able to come in and do this? So when home health care comes in to assess their client and they see these issues around, they're the one that makes the call. Generally, they'll they'll call or they'll tell the customer, hey, you need to get this stuff addressed. And if they have somebody to refer, then they'll refer them. If not, then they'll try to articulate exactly what they need. Okay. And everybody's need of cleanliness is different. Sure. If you go in 20 homes – There's 20 different levels of clutter. There's 20 different levels of clean. And it's so difficult to articulate what needs to happen before home health care can come in. It's it's a generalized overview, but I don't think people do a really good job of of stating exactly what they need in order to provide home health care services. Okay. So are there things that home health care says to you, you know, there's this problem, there's problem A, B, and C, but you go in and you see there's even more problems? Are, are oh, all the time. Do, sure. Oh, like what? What's <laughs> a good here, – here we go. Here come the stories. Oh, yeah. No, great. <laughs> Most of the time, home health care is going to be limited to, you know, the bedroom, the bathroom, the kitchen, the general areas. Okay. There's other areas that don't necessarily need to be addressed, but they, they come up from time to time. If home health care is there and they're and they're staying overnight, they need to make sure that we talked about this earlier about bed bugs not being present in the rooms. Okay. They can already be there from a previous guest. They could potentially be the ones bringing them in, which we've seen with traveling on nurses from time to time. Okay. And there's just a level – we just dealt with this last week. There's just a level of standard that each home health care company has that they – need to address to be able to address the needs of the senior. Bed bugs. Oh, my gosh. So hard to eradicate, right? Sure. And is it a big problem? I mean, do you see it like every day? Is that We don't. The pest control companies see this stuff all the time. Okay. We only get involved if the people were not able to do the prep list that comes along with the bed bug cleanings or with the bed bug extermination. Okay. And there's different types. There's a chemical treatment, and it will require one type of checklist. There's a heat treatment, and it requires a separate one. And each company is a little bit different. So if companies reach out to us or if people reach out to us and say, hey, we need your services, we don't take the lead on it. We will refer off a a pest control company or we'll use the pest control company that they've chosen and go off of their list. Okay, We don't want to overstep our – our place at all, we want to make sure that we've followed each instruction by the book. And the work is absolutely incredible that goes into a lot of these, and it and it doesn't even process with most people, which is why there's so many reinfestations because they didn't get them, you know, the first time. Okay, so bed bugs are only one pest. Sure. So I would assume that roaches and rodents. Mm-hmm. You're nodding your head. Do you see that every day? (laughs) We've been doing it so long, we kind of take on the challenged ones. Oh, my gosh. Okay. the ones that are outside of the basic call a junk company to come remove everything and throw it out, there's a lot more planning and procedure that goes into a a human being's home while they're still living in there. And we have have to help define what can be salvaged. And what's going to be too expensive for us to salvage and properly clean and disinfect and possibly decontaminate? Right. Because what I'm thinking of is roaches. They're really – I mean, we've all seen this on TV oh, yeah. where, like, they're covering the walls right. and everything. So they obviously get into the cracks and crevices of absolutely everything. Right. So if you have a family that is cleaning the house out to to leave and maybe downsize to assisted living or something like that – their furniture is infested with this stuff too, right. and um, and even the feces. Sure. So you can't. So what? How do you? How do you take care of that? And how do you determine what is salvageable? Because you can't haul that dresser that's got roach feces all over it to an assisted living facility. Right. 
it's and this came up recently in one of the networking groups that we're a part of. Okay. Not going to mention names, but they knew that the customer had stuff that needed to be properly cleaned and disinfected and taken from point A to point B. I told him, I said, we can clean it and we can sanitize it, but we are not pest control, so we can't kill the pest on there and we can't prevent them from coming back. You're going to have to get with a licensed pest control company to handle that part of it. Because even if we clean the feces off, it doesn't mean that we're able to clean off the bugs or the, what is it, the eggs yeah, and the that nits, type of yeah. stuff. Uh, so <laughs> is any of that salvageable? If I mean, or do you just have to burn that furniture if they decide not to get – I mean, what do you do with stuff like that? You can't even take it to a thrift store. If if there's homes that have been affected by bed bugs or roaches, we toss it. We don't even attempt to salvage okay. it. We don't try to recycle okay. it. We don't want cross contamination. Okay. And for years, we've seen other companies do that. They'll the easiest thing to do is, hey, let me go drop it off at ABC store and right. not have to run it to the landfill. Well, how irresponsible is that? Because that will affect the next person or the entire store, or at least sections of it. Well, you know, uh, we're going to have Kevin Oliver um, mm-hmm. in a couple of weeks. He's going to be here. He's the manager of the Habitat for Humanity Restore, and they've started accepting furniture where they right. never did before. So I want to ask him about that because sure. I'm sure thrift stores and Goodwill, these different places, probably are loaded with that kind of stuff, right? It depends on how responsible the people are that are dropping them off. Right, but I mean, it would be up to the people in the store whether they accept it or not, right? right. And a lot of these places, are simple, like at Goodwill, it's drop. Right. If there's nobody there, you can leave it at the door. Sure. And um, so you have to hope that they're looking for that stuff. Right. This is getting – I knew this was going to be creepy. <laughs> yeah. I, I think about these things, and when I go in these stores, I'm not a huge thrifter, I, you know, but I do go in these places. And now I, it's like I don't want to be too smart. Right. You know what I mean. It's like sure. the more you know, uh, ignorance is bliss, and now right. I'm not. So let me learn some more. Let's, let's talk about hoarding, okay? Sure. Absolutely. Hoarding has gotten to be just kind of a word that we throw out there. Right. Um, we use it too easily, like, oh, my sister such a hoarder, blah, blah, blah. That's not true. What is hoarding? Do you have a definition of hoarding? Hoarding is the attachment to stuff. It has less to do with the collection and the, the attachment that goes along with it. There's different types of hoarding that we run into. And the people that just pick stuff up and bring it home, they're doing it for a reason, but it's easy enough to handle that from a from a clean-out standpoint. Then you have hoarding where people are attached to everything sentimental, and it doesn't have to be from a death of a loved one. It's just a loved one. Think about how many times you know moms have kept their kids, whatever it is that they drew in school back in first and yes. second and third grade. Yes. Throughout 12 years of school, you have Six tons kids, and tons and tons right? of stuff. <laughs> and the likelihood is you ask the kids about it, they don't want it anymore. Right. So it ends up in the attic. Well, when it's in the attic for 20 or 30 years, what happens to it? It starts, you know, breaking down. It's not the same colors because it's just been, you know. It's brittle. It's brittle. It's there could be bugs in it. Yeah. yeah. And so it's no longer functional. And we always tell people, if you want to keep that, take pictures of it so you have the digital image and then toss the original from there. Right. But it's easier said than done. Okay, so hoarding, when the general public thinks of hoarding, we think of that TV show where right. there's stuff filled to the rafters and then the shed and then the, the storage place that they've rented down the street. And sure. Do you see all that? Do you see that? Oh, all the time. All the time. So yesterday. My, oh, gosh. I'll show you pictures of what we went into yesterday. <laughs> yeah, just and don't say, take me there. What in the world? <laughs> be glad that you don't have a videographer following us around with right, this because right. you would never be able to go into the house. It's hard for me to watch those into. shows. Yeah. It's really hard. And they keep showing the same picture over and over again. Right. They don't have enough B-roll to keep you going the whole show. And it's just carcasses everywhere. So I don't know if you can answer this question, but it's one that always is in my head. Is this hoarding thing like a fairly new phenomenon. I don't remember ever hearing about this as a kid or when I was younger. Maybe it just wasn't exposed then. What's the deal? So I think the TV show did a great job of bringing it to the public eye that this is an actual problem. <clears throat> it sensationalized a little bit on there. Sure. but And encapsulized. <laughs> yeah, it, it's very dramatic when you watch some of the shows. And I've talked to some of the people that are on the shows and let me know what's going on behind the scenes. But it's more, it's always been there. 
but it hasn't been as prominent as when you start putting it out on TV okay. and and assigning it names hoarding sure. and I just I, I don't like that name hoarder because it doesn't define a person it defines the behavior so it's hoarding disorder or hoarding behavior right and it always amazes me because I do know um, at least two people who are actual hoarders right and they're very nice one is a nurse right. Like, how is that possible? Because that person works in a sterile environment all day, every day on a professional level, and they come home. Because if you're a hoarder, it can't be clean just by definition of what a hoarder is. There's no room to clean anything. It's just bizarre to me. Sure. So you're telling me back in George Washington time, there were hoarders, and, you know, back in the 50s, there were hoarders? There's, I don't know about George Washington time, but probably in the 50s, it's been around for a very long time. And and it affects generations of people too. So well, of course it does. If you grow up in that environment, I, I, the, the people I know, they have a daughter that just went off to college, and I'm like, I'm sure her dorm roommate is one sorry puppy because right. <laughs> this gal doesn't know how to move a broom. You know, she's not been taught. Sure, I'm sure it's horrible. So I guess my next question is, if you know of a hoarding, if I know of a hoarding situation. I was always concerned about the children in the home, but right. I never called because the people are so nice. The right. kids are so sweet. When is somebody supposed to call in someone like you or report it to the authorities? Or when when does somebody need to come in and deal with this hoarding? How does that happen? So the calls would generally go to Department of Social Services. And if it involved children, it would go to Child Protective Services mm-hmm. or CPS. Right. If it involved adults, it would go to Adult Protective Services. Okay. Child Protective Services has a lot of power. If they deem a child in imminent danger or in any type of danger, they can make the decision to withdraw them from the home and put them into protective Which custody. Which is what stopped me. Right. I couldn't handle that. Well, there's other things that you can do, too. I got a call from DSS in a different county, and they had already taken a kid into protective custody from a, a hoarding bedbug case. And I said, has it gone to trial? And they said, yeah. And I said, if that happens, ask the judge to call me, and we'll see if we can get it in compliance before that happens. We don't want you know, a kid in the system for the next several months. And parents who are obviously trying to stop this, they didn't know. you know, They didn't know that there were resources like that out there, that people that were able to, to mobilize quickly to get it done. Okay. Now, the judge would have to understand you're not dealing with somebody that hasn't seen this. You're dealing with somebody that sees it all the time, and we can likely get it done. How much pushback are we going to get from the parents or the homeowners sure. or the HOA or whoever sure. we're having to work with? I know on the show they always have, what is her name, doctor? What's yeah. her name? You don't have that there, no. do you, dealing with these people? And we disclose that up front. We're not social workers. Right. The We have kind of a hybrid-type model because we've gone through so many of them and been so successful we can understand it better than the average person, okay. but it still does not qualify us to be a professional and do that. And we've had those requests before to have, you know, a professional. Someone on site? Right. Okay. So if there's not a professional like that on site to help kind of mediate what's going on and help through, how do you do that? Because I can't imagine they're hoarding for a reason. There's an attachment. You can't just go in and start hauling out. I mean, right. I would be upset with that, and I'm not a hoarder. Right. So. Is the is the homeowner always there? I want them there, if at all possible. Okay. Sometimes we'll get calls where there's a slip and fall in a house. 911's called. EMTs arrive. And then they have to open up a case if they deem that it could be potentially dangerous for the, the inhabitant. And that's where DSS gets involved a lot of times is when someone gets hurt. With the clean out, the property is still theirs, regardless of how we see it from the outside. It still belongs to somebody else legally. Okay. So we need to have permission, written permission from them allowing this. And then if we get there, even if we've got it signed and they start having some pushback, I want to make sure that they're psychologically taken care of as well. Because just because we got them to approve signing that paperwork doesn't mean that they're okay signing that paperwork. Oh, and okay. So what we generally do is – talk about a harm reduction model where you don't address all of it. You just address certain things. And that's where the uniform inspection safety checklist came from. It's an objective way to say, hey, we're not going to do all of this. 
we're going to address the major health and safety issues that are in this house right now to make it safer for you to live here. Although we'd like to do more, this is kind of a minimum road that we should take in order for you to be able to stay here. Okay, well, I think that's a good place to take a break because I want to follow up with that on some things. So we're going to take a break to hear a word from our sponsor, and we'll be right back. Most of us want to stay home as we age, but need assistance to do so safely. Carolina Healthcare can help. If you need support because of an injury, a cognitive impairment, or a debilitating diagnosis, Carolina Healthcare will provide a proven caregiver and a care plan tailored to your needs that includes bathing, housekeeping, medication reminders, and more. For over 35 years, Carolina Healthcare has been your award winning premier non medical in home care provider. Find out more at carolinahealthcaresc.com. I want to address for just a moment the listening audience that as I'm listening to all this, I remember that these issues that we're talking about today, there, there's, there, it's huge, it's broad, it's international, but I mean, it's certainly big locally here. And so if you know someone who may have a hoarding issue or an investation issue or something, can you please share this podcast with them? This may, may not be of interest to you, but I'm going to go ahead and ask you to share it because it needs taken care of. People need this service, and uh, in the end, they will thank you. Maybe not right away, but they will in the end. Okay, so to follow through, not just with hoarding, but you mentioned the harm reduction. Right. So that goes hand in hand with compliance. Right. So there's housing compliance. So what is housing compliance? Who determines that it's needed? And how do you go about meeting it? What is housing compliance? Housing compliance deals with the laws and regulations about how to maintain your home, both inside and outside. Inside your home is very limited unless you're living in an HOA and they they regulate that type of stuff. And that's where the difficulty lies is if it's not limited or if it's not regulated, how do you get in compliance with it? The outside is typically what gets hit first or where the, the effect is and people will start getting notices to clean stuff up. And then if they don't do it in a certain amount of time, then they'll get a fine. The Outside can lead to the inside, but what happens is if there's a slip and fall in a home and it opens up a case with DSS, then it becomes a public case, or at least in this, it opens a case in the, the public to where now we have to look into it. Now we have to go do a home assessment. And that's where the fine line between should we throw everything out or should we just take some stuff? And how do we decide what stuff to keep in here? And how do we decide what's safe? And so with the housing compliance, an organization, I believe it was a nonprofit organization, came up with the uniform inspection checklist. And it is a pretty thorough checklist that addresses what the minimum needs to be met in a home. It really isn't can't be enforced anywhere, but we generally use it when we're working with DSS because it gives an objective measure to finish. So it should say... 36 inches path through the entire home to make sure that areas with wheelchairs are going to be accessible. So that's basically a hallway. That's it. I mean. I I would think, right? How wide is a door? Is a doorway? The average bedroom doorway out there. Probably 36. Because if you need to get a wheelchair through there. I think of compliance is um, I'm always scared that there's going to be a fire in the house and that person can't get in or or EMS can't get in with their gear and stuff. So that does all that fall under compliance too? It does depending on what the regulations of the the home are. Uh, If it's an independently owned home, there's generally no compliance or nothing there. The international conference that I went to, there was a statistic that they threw out. It's hard to forget this. Hoarded homes, on average, catch on fire just about the same as a normal home. You would think it would be significantly more because of the the, the fire risk and sure. everything that comes along with those environments. You think, wow, they're so unsafe. The statistic they threw out, which made this really part of it or a bigger part of it, is that if a hoarded home catches on fire, about 92% of those cases, someone passes away, either a resident or a neighbor or a first responder. 
Because keep in mind, firefighters don't know that they're walking into this. Yes. If there's everything's uh, and so then it becomes a: Do we have a social obligation to report this to law enforcement, even if they can't do anything for it? Can they use the information here to keep first responders safe? Right. And in 2015, I attempted to get together a hoarding task force, including the city, a couple of counties, Department of Social Services. We had a lot of people that were involved in trying to get this together, and they had talked about putting this on a CAD list, CAD. And law enforcement knew what it was because it was a term that they used. And we were discussing if we find one of these homes, is there a way that we can report it to keep first responders safe but also keep the privacy of the people that were in the So homes? they know on a call that they're coming into this, right. that somehow they would be alerted to that before they arrive on scene. And I, I think it only makes it fair. I mean, firefighters have a tough enough job anyway. If this thing, if you have and a fire And paramedics too, right? yeah. yeah. When, they're, when they're showing up here, they don't if, – if nothing's been reported, they don't know. And – Imagine a hoarding case where there's used, uncapped diabetic needles everywhere. I mean, I just think of the mo- the piles of trash and whatever clothes, right. whatever. You step on it. There's an avalanche. You can right. hurt yourself. The firefighter sure. or the EMS people, they can hurt themselves too. I mean, it's a liability. I got hurt last year. Really? <laughs> in in a home with no power, no water. Easy for me to navigate. It was a referral from the senior networking group. Okay. As we were going through this home, the guy was in – uh, assisted living. He was trying to get his house up on the market, and we were trying to figure out what could be salvaged and what could be sold and what needed to be thrown away. And as we were walking through the kitchen, I had jumped over a pile of trash and just landed wrong. And apparently, there was a full Coca Cola bottle in there that I landed on. It was no big deal. I didn't break anything. Oh, okay. I'm sitting, you know, I'm I'm okay, but I ended up injuring my MCL. And I was limping for six weeks after that. Wow. First okay. time I'd actually gotten hurt. Right. Probably not the last. <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> right. um, it's well, and I was just being silly. It's oh, I do this all the time. And right. you know. So for somebody that knows better to end up getting hurt in it, like I don't know how often people get hurt in there because of just the environmental hazards that are there. So the, these homeowners, where you go in, where there, there's the different issues and everything, do you see a lot of health issues because they're living in these situations? We we see emphysema quite often. I would bet. We see the oxygen mask quite often. And I don't know if it's directly related to the living conditions, but I know that the living conditions are definitely affecting their ability to breathe sure. better. I would think asthmatics, too. Um, the dust if nothing else, would just be horrible. Sure. And if they're smoking, which a lot of them, I'm sure, do, they're older and they're not into that, you know, we all quit smoking years ago, but some of these people, I'm sure the nicotine that's on Mm -hmm. the walls and everything is, uh, you know, you're breathing all that in somehow or absorbing it somehow. Those are the tough jobs. We just got a small hoarding case that involved a lot of uh, chain smoking, and they said, can you come clean this? And I said, I mean, we can, sure. And I show up at the house and the lady's chain smoking in the living room. And I think she's got to stop that behavior or else you're going to be calling us back in to reclean it again. And to me, it just doesn't feel ethical to go through and clean something because somebody wants it done, knowing that you're going to have to come back in and do it again. Right. Like what, what net benefit did you receive because we cleaned that wall and now it doesn't look, you know, yellowish and it looks the normal color. But in a couple more years, this stuff is going to be just like this again. When imagine moving your parents into a house where somebody else had smoked and it had been properly cleaned. Right. They're going to smell that that odor. Right. It, it, they'll become nose blind to it, but it's always going to be there. What if and the people who are listening are wondering, oh, I wonder if I need to call Mike Young. How do they know if they have a problem? What are you saying to the listeners right now? I say you can call us about anything. And I'll try to walk you through without without it turning into a sales presentation. I'll try to figure out what the overall objective is. Can you do it? Do you want to do it? What's your time frame? And then we'll try to figure out a plan if we're a good fit or if somebody else is a better fit for you. We refer off a lot of work to professional organizers because they need more organizing work, not complete trash removal and clutter removal and you know bed bug prep and, right, and, and right. roaches and that type of stuff. So. And the organizers, in turn, will refer us that type of stuff over because they they don't want their employees working around it. 
Right. So do you have actual employees? You have a team that does mm-hmm. it just like on the show where they come in with the – We've got 17 now. Okay. And they're all employees. We don't have any 1099 contractors, okay. and we don't sub anything out unless – from time to time, we'll purchase one of the – or we'll rent one of the roll-off containers if the jobs are too bad for us to be able to use our equipment for. You sound like the only person I know who doesn't have an employee problem. <laughs> Everybody else is it's, looking for help, and they can't find it. And you, Are you fully staffed? We're fully staffed, yeah. That's crazy in such a business. Who wants to work for you? Not me. <laughs> well, and that's that's just it. There, <laughs> it's People don't come to us because they think, ooh, this sounds fun. They look at it from – I get to help people. Really? We stopped six evictions last year and some of the stuff that we were doing. And they see we're we're coming out with a YouTube series teaching other people how to do some of the stuff that we're doing, not to get a certificate in it, but so that they can better understand it and better serve their customers. Because there was no roadmap to most of this stuff when we got started. There were hoarding cleanup classes, but not housing compliance. What is bed bug prep? What is, you know, how do you properly clean roach poop that's been caked on the wall for 10 years? Right. There's not a whole lot of those training classes out there. And if you want to do it and you want to be safe, especially, you know, long term, if I want to keep employees for 10 years, I better keep them safe. I better keep them not sick. Before I ask you to tell people how they can get in touch with you, is there anything that you need to say that we didn't touch on that you want to make sure everybody hears? If there's concerns that you have someone's downsizing or living in what you think could be squalor conditions, reach out and ask somebody. You don't necessarily have to get DSS involved. They have their hands full of some of the worst of the worst. They may not be the best first response to it because there's just so many things that they're working with. But call somebody in the industry that knows how the entire system works and can put you in touch with the right – either the right company or the right people – or at least get you on the right track to get to where you're going. Okay. And how? what is the area that you cover? I know you're based here in Columbia, South Carolina, but where where all do you serve? We cover all of South Carolina. We are, we've gone into North Carolina and Georgia as well. We generally try to stay in South Carolina within about 45 minutes of Columbia. Okay. We'll, we'll do it depending on where the need is, or we'll try to find somebody to partner off with okay. in a different city. So you know guys like you or people, or businesses like you in other parts, like in Charleston, right. you have somebody you can sure. refer to. Well, with that being said, how can people get in touch with you? How can they find you? Easiest thing is find us on our website, www.palmettocommercialservices.com, or give us a call at 803-479-0812. Yes, that's Mike Young. Um, We'll have all that in the show notes for you at the end. Like I said, Mike will be back. We're going to put him on the calendar very soon. Be back every couple weeks, and we'll talk about all sorts of cleaning issues and hoarding issues because they're fun. But it's also, to me, the demand for it is kind of shocking. I did not realize the magnitude of the problem, not the magnitude of each individual problem, how big an issue is that you're so busy is overwhelming to me. Sure. And I'm glad I don't need you. I just yeah. like you. We, we hope you don't have to call <laughs> us. Yeah, I say that to all my doctors when they're like, bye, hope I never have to see you again. You know, I just, there's certain people I don't want to do business with. So. Sure. <laughs> but I like having you here. So thanks for coming and we will see you soon. Thank you. I appreciate the invite. The Reverse Podcast is written and produced by the F Suite LLC. All rights reserved. Our audio engineer is Andrew Hayworth. Thank you for listening. Palmetto Commercial Services is an extreme cleaning company focusing on severely hoarded homes and homes identified with health and or safety risks for the occupant. If a home is too cluttered or unsanitary for a caregiver to provide proper service, PCS can help. If DSS has an open case, we can bring the home into compliance to help close the case. We help clean homes with severe pest control issues, nicotine, fire hazards, tripping hazards, and more. Call us today at 803-479-0812.